Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carol Werner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute, and I am very happy to welcome you to this event this afternoon uh, to take a close look at an issue that we think is very, very important in terms of thinking about what is going on in our country and the future of transportation, this very, very important sector to our economy and indeed to its many impacts with regard to environment, to public health, and how our country runs at the national level, at the regional, at the state, and at the local level. And so we are particularly pleased to be working uh, with regard to this forum today with the American Public Transportation Association as well as the National League of Cities and the U.S. Travel Association because what we see with regard to investments in public transportation dramatically affects the kinds of services that are provided to Americans across the country, everywhere where we live and work, where we have our businesses. And so we're going to hear a lot more about that from our speakers this afternoon. And of course, as everyone I think is acutely aware, Transportation infrastructure is a very, very hot topic on Capitol Hill this week. Uh, there are many meetings going on across the House and Senate uh, because this is Infrastructure Week. Uh, many hearings have been held on both the House and the Senate side with regard to pending transportation bills. And of course, the Senate this morning in committee uh, marked up its uh, transportation reauthorization bill. Uh, which is expiring the end of this fiscal year, September 30th. So there are huge questions, huge stakes in terms of thinking about the whole role of public transportation and what it really does for us. And I am so pleased to be able to introduce as our first speaker today, Michael Milanofi, who is the president and CEO of the American Public Transportation Association. And his entire career of over 26 years has been spent in public transportation. He, of course, has been serving on many boards and commissions, but very importantly, he has worked on the manufacturing side for a bus manufacturer, and he has also led public transit agencies in a number of cities across the country before joining APTA as its CEO and president. And like me, he also, here in Washington, does not have a car and uses Metro every single day. And so Michael is going to lead our, off our discussion this afternoon in terms of presenting the findings of a new report that had been commissioned by APTA and its partners, taking a very important new look with new data coming forward with regard to the economics of transit investment. Michael? Thank you so much, Carol. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for all that you do, and we really appreciate all the, all the wonderful efforts of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. You've done so much to advance thought within the Capitol, and we really appreciate all of your efforts in hosting us here today. I'm very pleased to be participating in this event that focuses on the economic impact of public transportation as part of the inaugural Infrastructure Week. And I'm sure you all saw the cards, the Hallmark cards that were in the stores for Infrastructure Week. This is a great week to be here. And it's great to be here with two champions who are going to tell phenomenal local stories. We've got Mayor uh, Becker from Salt Lake City. We appreciate being here. Two-term Mayor Becker from Salt Lake City. You have, you've had tremendous strong leadership. You have shown what can happen when a community comes together and you can invest in infrastructure and really advance your community on so many levels and advance the business story, the economic story, the transportation story within your community. You've done a tremendous job. And we welcome you here and look forward to hearing your local story very much. And Elliot, always great to see you here and to be, have the opportunity to share a podium with you. You uh, always outshine the great speaking. As hard as I work on it, you're, you're so eloquent. But to hear this local story here in D.C., and obviously we've got good transportation investment, new things coming here in the city as well, and it's, it's great to be here and, and share that with you. And uh, most recently we were at, together at the U.S. Travel Association event. They held a special event in November at the museum, and it was called Connecting America Through Travel. Uh, it was a special conference that was spent a whole day just connecting, talking about the connection between travel industry and transportation. And one of the things that we talked about that we presented a report on the importance of having an airport connection to your downtown, something you just 
recently opened, Mayor Becker, in Salt Lake City, and certainly we enjoy here in D.C. And it's great to see how that data is, again, reinforcing an investment in public transportation, how it yields great benefits for your businesses and for your community to make it stronger and more globally competitive. Now let's talk about the research that we're here to discuss today. And we're very excited to talk about what we think is a piece of groundbreaking research. And the study, which is titled The Economic Impact of Public Transportation, and I believe we have some copies here uh, available. They're nodding to me. Yes, we do. Uh, it was conducted for APTA by the Economic Development Research Group, headed by Glenn Wiesbrod, and he's a prominent economist in the transportation sector. For the first time, what we're able to do here is to measure the productivity gains from the investment in operations and capital in public transportation. And this analysis, it goes beyond the traditional measurements, and typically we look at, when we put the money into public transportation, we look at the money that goes into the capital side, into the operating side, and you typically think of orange vests and hard hats. And we're going beyond that now. We're going to be looking at how it uh, improves business productivity in several ways in the study, and we'll detail that going forward. At the household level, the savings are achieved by reducing congestion and less reliance on automobile use. This saves the overall economy at least $18.4 billion a year. We're also improving employers' access to labor market and enhancing the free flow of people, goods, and commerce throughout our communities while reducing the impacts of congestion. And when you think about it, if we can get cars off the roadway, your goods, your commerce, your people can flow more freely through your community. They're wasting less time on the roadways and they're working more efficiently. We're able to capture the value of those improvements through this study. And that contributes more than $10 billion to the U.S. economy. And as I talked to another mayor recently, he, he talked about how they had a recent connection to their airport, just something that was new. And they, one of the impacts they found wasn't just getting people to and from the airport, but it was getting the workers to and from. And when do you need the workers there the most when the weather's bad? And having that transportation took away the fear of getting workers to and from the airport and it, made, it brought more stability to their economy. It was a real plus for their city. So let's talk about this next graphic. This slide, slide shows here is on the left, the traditional measure, measures we use, the, looking at the capital and operating investment, that yields about 22,000 jobs. And that's, again, that's the hard hats and yellow vests. What we're doing now is we're also looking at adding in the household savings, the improved employer labor access, and the impact of reduced congestion. And that's what those blend together to is to create increased productivity in your community. So as we invest in public transportation, we get this enhanced improvement of almost 29,000 jobs. And when you think about it, why do we invest in infrastructure? Why do we make these big investments in capital infrastructure that lasts for decades in our community? We do that to make our cities work better. This is the measure of the better. We found a way to measure the better, and this encapsulates that. And that rolls up to over 50,000 jobs, over 50,700 jobs on average that we uh, improve, that we sustain or create in our communities through the investment of public transportation. And that's for each billion dollars. So look at that. We're 50,000 jobs for each billion dollars. And many of you in this room have seen infrastructure just like this going on in your communities as we're building new public transportation infrastructure. This is the first time that we've been able to quantify these substantial productivity gains. And that's why we think this report is so important. People are asking, why are we spending these dollars? What are we going to get for it? This is quantifying that and giving us the ability to tell a better story. An overall investment in public transportation, it offers a $4 return for every dollar that's invested. And this tremendous return on investment, it resonates throughout the study. There's also a remarkable return on the investment in terms of generating tax revenue at the state, the local, and the federal level. Total tax receipts are estimated at $10.4 billion per year for local, state, and federal governments. And this is from a combination of enhanced productivity, traditional impact of spending, resulting from substantial public transportation investment. Let's go beyond the numbers. Here's some great examples. There are great examples all across the country, and not just in large cities, not just on coastal cities, but cities large and small across the country where we're seeing the benefits. This is San Diego up here. But let's talk about uh, a little local city and, and I'll give you a little, a little warm-up before we hear from Mayor Becker and from Elliott. Let's talk about Eugene, Oregon. 
nice small city out west. They put a BRT system in place. They call it the EMX, and it opened in 2007. See, it's got nice level boarding, off-board fare payment there, and it connects Springfield to downtown Eugene, Oregon. This bus rapid transit system runs about 60% of its operation in a dedicated right-of-way. And what's the benefit that we get from that? The service operates pretty much during business hours. It runs from 6 to 11, with buses running every 10 minutes on there. So you don't have to wait, you don't have to look up a schedule. Just go out there every 10 minutes, there's a bus running. This is very interesting. We've learned that congestion, of course, it's one of the main factors impacting our uh, health of our communities and economic viability. By putting this in place, the MAX has established itself as a valuable economic development tool for Eugene. Why? Because along the main corridor, traffic congestion was reduced by 30% as a result of putting this in place. Putting one BRT line in place, improvement of congestion in the city by 30%. That's a much faster flow of people, goods, and commerce throughout the community. And this connects major areas of employment and consumer spending, such as their Gateway Mall, Sacred Heart Medical Center, and the University of Oregon. And this is just one community that's reaping economic benefits from more public transportation investment. As more and more communities look to boost their economic growth, this study can better help them measure significant productivity that it can gain and help them to place their communities in a place of improved economic viability and competitiveness on a global scale. So during National Infrastructure Week, we are pleased to have the opportunity to share this tool today for those who are looking to provide more clarity on how this investment can impact the national economy as well as your local community. So let's turn to the federal partnership. We are, after all, in the capital today. And as you know, the current federal uh, uh, program expires September 30th, as Carol pointed out. Obviously, we're all aware of that. We've developed a set of recommendations that our board unanimously approved in December. So what we did is we took those numbers, those recommendations, and we put them through the data that's encompassed in this report. And what we found is that in, with our recommended investment over six years of just over $100 billion, 100.4 to be exact, we predict that we'll have the following benefits for our country. We already know from our traditional measurement of public transit that an investment of, will yield, an, uh, for each billion dollars, will yield an investment of 1.1 million jobs. And this could turn into 2.4 million jobs overall for the $100 billion program, uh, based on the millions of dollars spent by the employees. So as we put more people to work, they're going to spend, there's going to be that multiplier, and we're going to see additional jobs throughout our country. Our recommendations for Congress would garner $66 billion in business sales per year. To put that in perspective, that's more earnings than Google had in 2013. Investment in transit matters. And let's not forget that this rolls through to the private sector. It is the private sector that builds our infrastructure. It's our private sector that builds our rolling stock, our buses and trains. And fully 73% of the federal dollars that flow into the public transportation industry flow right through to the private sector because they're primarily capital dollars. They flow through the private sector. They're creating jobs all across this nation. And our recommendation for investment in public transit garners $81 billion in gross domestic product or GDP every year. And that ranks higher than the GDP of more than 100 nations. The facts are clear. Public transportation investment makes the U.S. economy significantly more vital and productive by generating hundreds of thousands of good-paying, long-term private sector jobs and millions of dollars of tax revenue, and it delivers a four-fold rate of return on this investment. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. I look forward to questions later on. Carol, I return the podium to you. Thank you. Pretty impressive data. I now want to turn to Mayor Ralph Becker, who is the mayor of Salt Lake City. He, as Michael alluded, um, he has been elected, re-elected to a second term um, he, in 2011. And I think what's important to also recognize is that his leadership has been recognized by his peers. Uh, in that he is the first vice president of the National League of Cities, and he is part of the president's state, local, and tribal leaders task force on climate preparedness and resilience. Before becoming mayor, Mayor Becker served in the Utah State Legislature as a member of its House of Representatives for 11 years, 
and served as the House Minority Leader for five of those years. He has a very interesting story to tell with regard to what is going on in Salt Lake, one of our really uh, uh, wonderful cities in this country. And so to tell that story and the transportation uh, piece of how this has really made Salt Lake City come alive, Mayor Becker. Well, thank you. It's so good to be with you and to be part of this forum uh, discussing uh, transit and its impact on our economy and really the impact on our lives and in our communities. As you were describing my background, I thought, God, that is a long time in politics. I don't know that that's, that's where, where I expected to be or certainly where it is necessarily a testimony to, um, to quality living. I'll put it that way. But on the other hand, I'll say that, um, that what we do... Uh, those of us who work in the public sector, who work around public transit and, and, and work for our communities and our states and regions and, and nation, uh, gives incredible satisfaction uh, to be able to do what we believe, uh, hopefully, will serve our communities and, and serve our society uh, today and, and leading into the future. Uh, as I think about transit and think about transportation and its effect on its economy, uh, I can't help but think about it in the context of, uh, of how we live and how we make, uh, make decisions. Uh, and for us at the community level, and I, I know this is very specifically true in Salt Lake City, but I think this is true in communities with the National League of Cities, U.S. Conference of Mayors, and, and other local governments, uh, we look at livability. We look at what is it that is going to create the environment, the full environment, natural, physical, and social environment that makes for a healthy community and makes for a healthy society that we live in. And so that context really um, leads, I think, to a discussion about the, the elements and the parts of our communities and the parts of our decisions in our society that make us successful, that make people happy, uh, and that make people uh, prosperous and the society prosperous. Um, in the case of what we've done, I'm going to hone in here really on our region and in, uh, in the Salt Lake area. In the case uh, of what we have done and I've seen happen now from before I certainly became mayor, um, I think it's centered around three things. Uh, one is to establish a clear vision for our community and for our region. That the community as a whole and community leaders, whether they're private or public sector, buy into as, as what we want to be, uh, given where we are today. And in the case of the Salt Lake region, the Wasatch Front as we call it, um, we've been very fortunate for now more than 20 years uh, to have had an ongoing community visioning process I think that term gets overused a bit, but an ongoing really effort and process that's involved people uh, in their neighborhoods, uh, in their own forms, uh, in their planning commissions and city councils and county commissions and county councils, um, and with the business community in an ongoing effort to define where we are today, but more importantly, where do we, where do we want to be in the future, and what is it going to take for us to get there? And that has, I think, shaped a common sense of purpose uh, in our region that has allowed us to do things that I think not only wouldn't be impossible otherwise, uh, but I don't think anyone would have expected otherwise. Uh, so the, the vision is incredibly important. The second piece of that, I think, are the partnerships of people rallying around that vision regardless of their, even their necessarily specific ideas about what the outcome should be. And, and keeping, in, uh, keeping in mind strongly what the outcomes are that we want. Um, and, and finally, communicating. And by communicating, I don't just mean us telling folks what, what we believe they want, but having that ongoing interaction in a way that shapes and adapts and, and reforms continually what it is uh, that we do and, and how we do it. Uh, so in terms of a livability and sustainable community, that means in a place like Salt Lake, uh, looking at air quality, looking at our use of energy, looking at our prosperity and economy, looking at our overall quality of life, 
Uh, but let me talk um, uh, sort of quickly in terms of the, of the, um, of the region here. Uh, we've got obviously a beautiful environment to work from. We've got some incredible natural assets. Um, but we also um, have had the benefit of deciding, uh, really I'd say back in the early and mid-90s, uh, that if we were going to maintain this quality of life that we so treasure, uh, we were going to have to change our transportation systems specifically. We couldn't build roads and build our way out of and into the future uh, that we want. Um, and with that came some decisions, some of them I'd say risky decisions at the time, uh, to start building rail, and light rail specifically. Uh, and we had an, a great entrepreneurial partner with the Utah Transit Authority um, that was willing to take risks that I think very few leaders probably would. In other words, after a referendum failed to build light rail, they went ahead and built it. It did happen to cost the general manager his job, but it's a small price to pay. <laughs> Um, uh, because it was, it was controversial. People didn't know what to expect. They said people wouldn't get out of their cars. But the fact of the matter was, like I think every place around the country, the day rail opened, the world changed for us. And it was no longer a question of whether or not people would ride it. We were exceeding ridership projections. It was a question of how quickly could we build out the system. And from that point on, referendum after referendum passed with over 60% of the vote. Uh, so we built the, some an initial spine of light rail and then an extension up to the university in our medical center um, uh, from downtown Salt Lake, a spine that went all the way through the Salt Lake Valley. Uh, and then uh, UTA went back to the public, and we all went back to the public, private and public together, and, um, and passed a referendum that basically amounted to building 70 miles of rail in seven years, um, light rail, commuter rail, um, and uh, most recently streetcar um, that wasn't part of that package, but we were fortunate with the Tiger Grant and our federal partners there. Um, and we now have a system that has an incredibly strong backbone. And there are a few things I think that um, led to the success uh, ongoing. Uh, one was those 70 miles of rail were built a year ahead of schedule, and they were built under budget. Now, that doesn't happen very much in government, so we're all very pleased when that happens. But it also creates the kind of confidence uh, in the public that we, uh, we are going to live up to our responsibilities and obligations uh, to do that. Now, specifically, I'm going to talk about quickly two, uh, two developments in Salt Lake City. Um, we had, uh, we've had from the beginning, really, plans to build a rail line from downtown to the airport. This is the street uh, post-construction of the light rail line out to the airport. But when we decided to, uh, to put the light rail line in with our transit partners, we said, we're going to completely redo this street, make it a complete street. Uh, this was probably one of the ugliest streets in our region. Uh, it, was in a, it went through a, a badly underserved area in terms of the population and, um, and was just was not a desirable place. Uh, when we rebuilt this street, um, we took out a lane in each direction. We put in bicycle lanes on the street. We obviously have light rail running down the middle. We buried the, the elect electric uh, utilities. We put in new lighting. We put in new landscaping. We have an off-street off 10-foot shared path, not a sidewalk, so for both bicycles and pedestrians. And immediately the investment started in a major way. We now have over 1,000 new units of housing along the street. This opened last April. Um, and we are seeing a relatively quick transformation of this street and the development around the street. We redid all the zoning as well, and planning and zoning in the corridor to a form-based transit-oriented development zone. Uh, to be able to provide for the flexibility of what, what folks wanted. Uh, today, this is our model street for an arterial road, an arterial street uh, in Utah, and really serves as an example for us in the city and us throughout the region of how we can and should accommodate uh, the, all forms of transportation. Uh, we, we say in, the, in our mobility agenda, drive if you want and you must, but let's not make that the best or easiest way to get around. And this street exemplifies that. It is now being uh, heavily used, I think, um, for, um, 
uh, for others um, to follow. And as I said, we're kind of reaping rewards. Um, we also just opened, so this opened in April. Uh, in December, we opened our first streetcar line. Salt Lake had 140 miles of streetcar. Uh, like uh, most places around the country, in 1950, it basically disappeared, uh, much to our chagrin today. Um, Roger Rabbit killed it, and <laughs> we're, sorry for the, we're sorry for the loss. Uh, but it has really, um, again, had this incredible impetus, both economic impetus, but also community um, togetherness and connectedness uh, in a part of our city, again, that was underserved. Uh, we opened this line in December. We already have over $400 million um, of investment around that, and the applications keep coming in. And we're hoping to, we now have approval, we're hoping to extend that line here in the very, in the very near, near future. Um, so it's had an incredible impact um, in, economically in our community, but in the energy. And, and particularly this part of the city. This is an older uh, part of the city that had a business district that was in pretty bad shape. Um, and it is now, I think, one of the best neighborhoods. It was recognized as one of the 10 best neighborhoods in the country. And really, streetcar has been the catalyst for it. Uh, it was starting to happen. You could see signs of it before certainly streetcar developed. Um, but once uh, we were able to uh, be successful with the Tiger Grant and move from it being 25 years away under the State Transportation Implementation Plan to it, it happening virtually in a three to five year period, um, the whole condition of this entire part of the city uh, started to transform and that's just accelerating over time. So we, of course, love our story in Salt Lake and, and love, our, love our city. Uh, we feel like we've got a long ways to go. We've got ambitious plans uh, to expand our streetcar system, uh, not just in this area, but two other streetcar lines in Salt Lake are in various stages of planning and design. Um, and we see it as a key to our future, uh, that uh, not only does it create the kind of prosperity which is critical to the success of, of any city, uh, but it ties people together. Uh, that transit and alternative modes doesn't put people in a shell. It gets people interacting with each other and living with each other and engaging in conversation uh, in ways that never happens in, a, in almost solely, as has been our experience now for, for too many decades, um, where we're driving back and forth both to work and to play um, and to get our kids around and do our errands. So, um, we're excited about our future. You know, I, um, I tell other folks, both in our region and, and elsewhere, um, that for us as a city, we're going to maintain our streets, we're going to do our best to take care of our sidewalks, but our future infrastructure investment is around transit. And it's both for the prosperity of our city, uh, but for the health of our community. And I think our community recognizes that, uh, the region increasingly recognizes it, and I should say that I'm hopeful, um, but we can't always hold out too much hope, that this year in Congress we will see a transportation reauthorization bill that allows us to commit the kind of long-term investment that we need to make um, to be able to, uh, to continue to make the improvements in our community that reflects today's needs, not the needs of decades ago, um, and, um, and that recognizes the changing paradigm in transit and transportation. Um, increasingly, that's where we want to invest and we see others. Active transportation is probably the most energetic area, bikes and pedestrians, uh, that I see in our whole region today. And we, we need our partnerships. We need our private partnerships. We need our state partnerships from the local level. And we need our federal partnerships. And I think, you know, on behalf of cities and towns across the country, uh, we want our federal government to work with us as partners and Congress so that we can be successful as communities. Thank you for allowing me to be with you. Thank you very, very much for telling um, the Salt Lake City story, which I think is so important. And I think that there are some other 
slides that you may want to talk about a little bit later in terms of, of um, showing parts of that story as well, if you would like to, and, uh, um, when we move to discussion. And so our final presenter this afternoon before we move to um, discussion with, with all of you is Elliot Ferguson, who is the president and CEO of Destination DC, which is the official convention and tourism corporation for our nation's capital for, for right here. And certainly all of us who live in the Washington metro area know how important tourism is, all of the meetings that are held here. It is just an incredibly uh, vibrant part of making this economy and this city and this region uh, hum. And so we are very excited to have Elliot here today to really talk about, uh, about that whole piece of our economy and its whole connection with regard to transit. Elliot? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carol, and good afternoon to all of you. We appreciate your excitement and the glamorous uh, infrastructure week um, presentation of the day because it is sexy and very important. Um, as Carol stated, I uh, have the pleasure of being, I guess, the big cheerleader for promoting Washington as a convention and tourism destination. And um, I normally would have tons of slides and things that showcase why Washington is a great destination, but I'm assuming I don't have to do that with you guys because you hopefully live here or you're here and you've, you're being able to, uh, to enjoy the city. But if you want to learn more about what we do, Washington.org is our website. You'll hear and see tons of information on D.C. as a destination, which is the part in which we do the most. We work really closely with APTA. Uh, we really appreciate the role that you all bring uh, to the table, Michael, and, um, and um, the, the importance of infrastructure, which is something we were talking about early this morning at the U.S. Travel um, Executive um, Forum in which I attended. And uh, Mayor Becker, I work really closely with Scott Beck, my counterpart, uh, in Salt Lake City, which is an extraordinary destination, and I applaud you guys and your efforts in terms of bringing the infrastructure together, which is really important. So now, D.C. is a destination. We had 18 million visitors that came to Washington in 2013. My goal is to continue to make that number go up so I can keep my job. Um, so what that means for us as folks that live here is that if you love the Cherry Blossom Festival but you hated the traffic, uh, in the future years, we intend to continue to have more and more people come to the city. So infrastructure is extremely important to us because, you know, all the things in which people say that are great about uh, Washington as a destination, um, we always get dinged for the same things. Traffic in the city, parking is difficult, congestion, and of course parking tickets, which you are official when you get a parking ticket when you move to Washington, D.C., which I did 12 years ago. So our goal, as we tell people to come to Washington, D.C., is we tell them, do not drive to Washington. You know, when you're in the city, it's a small destination. It's easy to get around. Um, all the infrastructure changes that are happening in our destination are extremely important and crucial to the overall goal of bringing people to the city because we don't want cars, but we want more people. And one of the things in which we focus on with the U.S. Travel Association, um, who I'm also representing, is the fact that by the year 2021, um, President Obama basically said that he wants uh, over 101 million visitors to the, the, the U.S., um, which we're on our way to that number and that goal very soon. Um, but as we listen to those numbers and we look at the numbers of folks that are coming to Washington and Salt Lake and other cities, we realize that the glamorous part of what I do in terms of marketing Washington cannot be successful without the infrastructure that's needed to make sure that we can get folks around the city. So the fact that Metro is finally going out to Dulles by the year 2018, um, keeping my fingers crossed, um, we know it's almost there, um, is extremely important to us because we, as we're going after the global community, um, the global community is basically saying when we come to Washington, D.C. or to Salt Lake or any other city, we don't, we don't want to drive. We want to walk around the city. We want to get on a bicycle. We want to experience our destination, the destination in which we're visiting because that's what they're accustomed to in their cities. 
So we need to make sure that that infrastructure is in place for a variety of reasons. So that at a time like this, when so many people are in the city, graduations are taking place, and I'm getting the calls from folks saying, I can't find a room in Washington, and they have to stay outside of the city, we want them to be able to take Metro to get into Washington, D.C., because it's easy and accessible, safe, friendly, and all those other variables that are extremely important to us. As you look around Washington, the key things that are that um, the, the positives that people say about Washington is, of course, how great the metro system is. We're not the largest in the country, but we're the, one of the cleanest and more efficient systems in the country. So the expansion of metro, as we're looking at bringing more and more people to the region, is vital to the success of, of our destination as we continue to grow. Right now, there are over 50 cranes in the air in Washington, D.C., and a lot of that infrastructure that's going in place is in place for visitation to the city. So we're looking at new hotels, new restaurants, things that are happening in Maryland at National Harbor, um, and of course the trolley, um, the, the study in terms of having trolley go out to National Harbor because it's important that folks that are staying out there because they're telling them that they're coming to Washington and then they get there and they realize they're not, but they want to come to the city and we need to make sure that they have access to Washington. So we're, we're making sure that they have a, a way to get to our city and enjoy sporting events and restaurants and all the things that they were told when they, uh, when they originally started looking at Washington as a destination. So, as we look at what's important as a destination, what we do is economic development. So we're in place, um, similar to what Michael said in terms of the infrastructure changes, to create new jobs, because in Washington, D.C., the fastest growing sector of our economy is tourism. So we're not the largest, the federal government employs more, but we're the fastest growing. And we'll create more jobs long term, just like in Salt Lake City and other destinations that rely heavily on, 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 um, on the infrastructure of visitation. And the way I look at infrastructure is I think about it like when you finish college and you move to a city like Washington or Salt Lake and you get that efficiency apartment um, because it's, you want to live in the heart of the city. I live on Capitol Hill right down the street and I know how it is. And though I have a car, but I do take public transportation on a regular basis. So five years later, you're probably going to get married. You might still live in that efficiency apartment because you still want to live in the city. And then a few years later, you have kids. Are you going to stay in that efficiency apartment? Probably not, unless you really, really like each other. <laughs> so when you think about infrastructure, think about it from the standpoint of how you continue to evolve as a person and your life continues to change. And one of the things, some of the things in which we focus on as a destination and as a country through U.S. travel is the fact that once upon a time, probably over 30 or 40 years ago, the infrastructure in the United States, we were number one. Right now, we're not, we're in like number 20 something in terms of infrastructure. So we're not keeping up with the global demands and the changes that are happening in other countries that have stronger infrastructure. You know, we talk about China and we talk about other destinations that have high speed rail and connectivity to any place in the country. Now, we know they're catching up. But by being, able, by being the last, it's like being the, the last ballpark that's built. You're always the best until the next one is built. And that's what's happening in all those other countries. And our infrastructure has existed for a long period of time. And I talked about the number of visitors coming to the United States. Well, if you've flown into any of our airports, we were just talking earlier today, and the president of the Miami Convention and Visitors Bureau said it takes about three or four hours to get through customs to come into, the, into um, Miami. Welcome to the United States. Not so much. So we've got to focus on infrastructure changes because if you travel anywhere outside of the United States, you know, their, their airports are fantastic. They're like malls. They're 24 hours. You actually want to stay there. You don't mind getting stuck because they're nice. Well, maybe not true there, but, uh, but you get my point. And I think that the infrastructure changes that are important to the United States are the things in which we need to focus on and things in which we were discussing early today at the U.S. Travel Association. This morning, we started our, our conversations with, uh, um, with um, Amy Globachar, who came in, Senator Globachar, and talked about the importance of travel to the United States as a whole and how infrastructure plays a key role in our ability to bring people to our country and move people around um, our destination. So as, we're looking, as we look at marketing our destination, which that's the fun part, that's the cheerleader part, we also look at the things that are really, really important and vital to our success. So our campaign is DC Cool. So we don't want people coming to Washington and say it was an uncool experience because I couldn't get around or I couldn't get to certain parts of the city. So the infrastructure that we see on 8th Street Northeast that will continue to um, evolve, 
the circulator and other modes of transportation and the fact that we encourage visitors to take public transportation plays a vital role in our ability to attract folks to our city because it only takes one person you know it's like growing up you know if I, I remember talking to my mom and I said you remember back in when I was five years old and I did this wrong and you did, did this to me and I remember when I did this wrong and you did this to me and she says well do you remember any of the good things that happened I'm like well of course I do but my point is if you have a bad experience that's what you're going to go back and talk about. You might say, yeah, I had a good time in the U.S. or in Washington, D.C., but if you had a really, really bad experience, that's going to resonate and that's going to change people's perceptions of your destination and perhaps dissuade them from coming to, to Washington or, or, or any other city. So infrastructure changes are extremely important to us, and we applaud the importance and glamour of infra National Infrastructure Week. So I appreciate the opportunity to share some comments, and I look forward to answering any questions. Thanks so much, Elliot. And I must say, it really is incredible. No matter where you go, the whole role of tourism, of visitation, um, in so many cities where it has become such a huge part of so many towns and cities, uh, local economies, and what's, what's really going on there. Uh, before we start Q&A, I was just wondering, we can show some of those other remaining slides, Mayor Becker, so if you wanted to just say a couple words about them. Do you want to put them up, Amory? Um, so that we get the full Salt Lake City treatment here. Well, you'd have to come to Salt Lake, here. which we'd love to have you do <laughs> if you want the full. Well, it's a terrific city, so. So I, I think we just had a few slides here of the, uh, of the light rail lines, and I think we may have had one as well of the uh, streetcar line. Uh, but these are light rail in downtown Salt Lake, um, and we can't help but show views of Salt Lake. Uh, we are really are in the mountains, and uh, and and love the uh, love our surroundings. Um, so really, I don't need to show too much okay. more. I think okay. I think I described some of the basics, and okay, just happy to answer to make questions. Sure we saw the people. street cars. Yeah. Thank so you. great. Okay, so now let's open it up for Q and A, and if you could identify yourself, please. Okay, in the back. Good afternoon, and thank you to all the presenters and for the studies and the information, which is very valuable and helpful. My name is Rick Ryback. I'm with Just Economics. And um, one of the things that occurs to me is that uh, transit can be a double-edged sword. Uh, on the one hand, we create transit to facilitate development and to help people, particularly people who don't have the income to afford their own automobile, to help meet their mobility and accessibility needs. But on the other hand, if transit is well designed and well executed, land price increases around the transit stations can displace the very businesses and families that we were intending to be the beneficiaries. And uh, some, some cities have utilized value capture techniques to help internalize these uh, negative externalities to help uh, reduce real estate speculation and the ensuing uh, troubles that that can cause and thereby make uh, both housing and business locations more affordable near transit. Just wondering if the speakers have any knowledge about that and any experience with uh, using value capture to help uh, make transit uh, a greater benefit to the people who, who need it. Thank you. Rick, thank you for the question. You've touched on, on a couple of really key issues there. The first is, is value capture. It's a, a technique that is used in, in other countries. You certainly find it in Japan and Hong Kong and other communities where they, the, their structure is set up where they, the uh, transportation network owns much of the land along the corridor and are able to take the revenue that's generated from the private sector businesses there to continue to facilitate the operation of that transportation there. And as we look at some of our policies going forward, those are things that we want to look at as a policy change or, or opportunity within our own country. Uh, uh, and an adjunct type of uh, example of that is certainly the Dulles Corridor and the Silver Line we're using similar revenue off of the tollway out to the airport to build the Silver Line, and actually it's the airport authority that's building the Silver Line and turning it over to Ramada. And so there's a combination there where we see the increased transportation options is creating that value and helping to sustain the operation. So often we look at these capital investments, infrastructure, big expensive projects take years to build, last for decades. We have to continue to invest in them, and if we don't, they'll atrophy, and we've certainly lived through that in some of our cities, and, and we're seeing that investment that we're making now in and WMATA's in the metro 
system here. The system was allowed to atrophy a little bit, and now we're investing to bring it back and continue to have a good state of good repair. So if we have a model that allows us to continue to do that, it's very important. The other thing that you talked about is the impact on housing values along transit corridors. And we did a study last year with the National Realtors Association, found that uh, residential real estate since 08 along high-frequency transit corridors was 42 percent more resilient. What that meant is as prices dropped, they dropped less along transit corridors. As they came back, they came up better along transit corridors. And that was because they allowed access to jobs. And I think that's one of the curious to focus on here is if you have access to jobs, if you have access to have good transportation that is safe, reliable, dependable, and you can count on with your family. If you know what it's going to cost you every day, you can build a family budget around that and allows being along that transit corridor allows you to have a more efficient, effective uh, household. You don't, have, you don't have to have a car, and so it allows you to have a, be a greater uh, active person within your community. Mayor. Uh, I might just uh, say from the experience we've had in Salt Lake City, uh, you raise actually a really important topic as it relates to transit development, rail development particularly, where you get uh, these these increases in values among uh, obviously the surrounding property owners uh, from transit. And how do we recapture that in a way that goes to the benefit of the community and provide for a leveling of housing costs? Um, we've got a number of tools locally, and it varies a lot from community to community. In, um, in Utah, we have redevelopment agencies and community development agencies. Um, and in Salt Lake City, and I think it, at times at least, I'm not sure if it still is today, has been a requirement that 20 percent of the incremental value that we get uh, from the increased values in our redevelopment areas has to go into affordable housing. Um, and we've, uh, we've not only taken that to heart, I think we've usually exceeded that sort of a commitment in terms of how we as a city participate in making sure we have a good mix of affordable housing among our housing types um, in our redevelopment areas. And in all of our transit corridors, we just developed a new one in the corridor going out to the airport. We've had one in the Sugar House area where our streetcar line uh, just opened. Um, we're seeing actually a really good mix of housing affordability, and we're committed to that uh, going forward. So. It can be, I think, a real challenge and problem if it is not addressed up front in things that communities do and, and transit agencies obviously can be helpful in that as well. Yeah, I totally agree. Thank you. Um, clearly, there's always a negative associated with uh, the cost of housing increasing with any, any development, but the positives outweigh the negatives, and I think that um, in Washington there is a a goal to make sure that there is a percentage of affordable housing for that reason. But I think when you look at the positives of the development, you know, good good example as you look at um, across the river, Anacostia River, um, as we're talking additional transit lines, especially with trolleys, you're now looking at businesses that may not have necessarily um, looked at those particular areas, creating new jobs and opening shop in those areas. And the same with the suburbs in, uh, of the greater Washington area. So you're now looking at new housing going up because of those transportation routes that exist, not necessarily in Northern Virginia with the Silver Line, because that's, but you do see even additional development along those areas. So there, there are always pluses and minuses, and it's important that we make sure that our local governments focus on the needs of the indigenous population in those areas and make sure that there is some type of affordable housing. Okay. Um, we'll start here. There are about four or five hands, so we'll start here with you first. Here. I have a follow-up question on that for the mayor. Um, as a Washington, D.C. resident, we all have our feelings about your affordable housing, but <laughs> that's another conversation. Um, the affordable units um, that you're developing that, from the redevelopment, reinvestment, are they along the transportation corridor or are they scattered along the city? Uh, they need to be spent in the corridor, in, in the redevelopment area. Now, the corridor, it's often the redevelopment area is larger than just the area that's immediately proximate to the transit line, but um, the redevelopment areas, we've got different ones spread around the, around the city, but the ones around the, the rail lines, um, they need to be spent generally they need to be spent in those corridors in that redevelopment area there are ways to shift that money around but that's the general approach okay over here 
I've got a simple question for uh, Mayor Becker. How did you get the uh, State Highway Department, um, DOT, to give up uh, two lanes of uh, traffic on the uh, university line? That seems like a significant achievement. Uh, it would have been, except we took over the road. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, that cost us about $80 million to take over their road, so they were glad to give it up. Um, but I will say this, um, in, uh, in, in very recent times, literally the last six months with the new UDOT, as we call them, our State Highway Department uh, Director, we have seen uh, them adopt a complete streets philosophy. I think they're one of the first in the country to do that as a state highway system. But it's already making big differences in the way we're developing our road systems and streets. Thank you. Very interesting. Okay. Uh, right back there. Thank you. Hi, Sandra Baer with the Smart Cities Council. Um, as Mayor Becker said, the paradigm is shifting for transportation across the world, I think. Um, but I'm very curious about the financing strategies because so many cities around the world are sort of struggling with, you know, finding money, finding new money, uh, looking at uh, maybe some new options for financing transit projects. And the other question is, have you seen or heard of uh, new apps that cities are using that um, generate revenue, um, parking congestion, traffic congestion, et cetera. Thank you. Um, financing is always a challenge. Uh, every project seems to take a life of its own when it comes to figuring out financing, and we've attempted to be creative, entrepreneurial, um, tap every possible source we can to accomplish our projects because the revenues in general have not been going up. Um, certainly relative to inflation and just overall costs. So um, we just, I, I, the short answer is we try to be creative. We do everything from creating um, redevelopment and, and community development areas. Um, we, we've worked on and done some uh, property tax assessments along the corridor. Uh, we've partnered uh, heavily whenever we can with uh, federal government, in the case of our streetcar line, we were fortunate to get a Tiger grant to be to achieve that. Otherwise, we really wouldn't have been able to develop it. Um, and we've uh, we've entered into some interesting uh, construction and development partnerships with not only our transit agency but with the contractor to uh, achieve cost savings and sharing the cost savings among the three partners that are making the investment. Uh, so it's been a, a mix of things. I think the big untapped area, and it was mentioned earlier, really goes with more almost direct private sector investment um, in, the, uh, in the development of our transit. And I think we've got um, a ways to go there. We've had a hard time, I think, uh, realizing, what, realizing the potential there because I think when you're looking at a private investment, my own sense is that you need to work with the business community and the property owners well in advance of when the project is coming online. Otherwise, they think they're already going to get the project and get the increased values, so it makes it much more difficult. And we've got, I know we have a ways to go, but I also know there are others who have been successful around the country, I think, in, um, in, a, in looking at all different kinds of ways to finance. But that is actually, on uh, some of our bigger projects that we're looking at now, we're trying to plan for the financing piece of this from the very beginning of conception, because otherwise I think we fall behind the eight ball. And, and if I just might add to that, I think one of the important things to remember is that public transportation is an, and has been for many, many years a combination of funding. It's the passengers are paying their fares. Every time they get on the bus or the train, they're paying their fare. There's a, a local portion that comes from either you know, sales tax or valorum tax or, or any combination of, of taxes and other fees that are generated locally, oftentimes the state participates at some level, and then the federal government participation, which is primarily capital, especially for uh, uh, large urban uh, uh, cities. So there's a combination of all those pieces, and then you add in now the, the uh, financing piece. We're moving from more of a funding model to a financing model, of making sure that we uh, maintain the ability for cities to borrow for all their different capital needs, and, and not just in, in the one area. But also, the uh, as we move into this, uh, view, and we talk about it here in the report, transportation isn't just about moving people from A to B, it's about redeveloping our communities, making our cities work better, the economic vitality of them, and the redevelopment of, of different parts of our communities. As we look at it in a more holistic way, you have greater opportunities to bring in more partners and to have that public-private partnership. It's not just about moving a person from A to B, it's about making your city work better and be more globally competitive, and that's what brings in that bigger financing piece.
And it's also about the connectivity from a national perspective as well. You know, and the federal, we can't do what, we, what needs to happen in the U.S. without the federal government's involvement. You know, the fact that you cannot catch a train from Washington, D.C. going west um, is, is a deal breaker in terms of uh, the way we're perceived as a destination. Because if you go anywhere in Europe, you can go by train anywhere and everywhere. So as we're looking at what's happening in cities, which is extremely important, um, and we haven't even touched on the environmental, uh, the, the positive environmental impact of having uh, public transportation as an option, but when you think about our infrastructure as a country, our highways, bridges, things in which we hear about on a regular basis which need improvement, um, we'd love to see high-speed rail throughout you know, in my lifetime, um, and um, throughout beyond just going from Washington, D.C. to Boston, which as the rest of the, as the global community looks at coming to the U.S., their first, you know, they're not necessarily wanting to fly from place to place, even though we're a large country. They want to experience uh, traveling across country and seeing the Midwest and, and seeing other destinations. And it's just, it's not even possible, and that's, a, that's a, a black eye for us as a destination. In terms of apps, there are some apps associated with traffic, um, and I can maybe share some with you after, after the panel. Okay, we have a few hands. <laughs> so, okay, we'll start here first, and we'll take a couple over here, and then we'll... Go to the mayor. Uh, John Wetmore with pedestrians.org. Uh, how important is having walkable areas around transit stops to getting the full economic benefit of transit? Oh, it's, it's critical. It's, people need choices. What we're seeing is people want to have choices, and, and especially on both ends of the genealogical spectrum. We've got the baby boomers that are often moving back into our cities and they want to drive less. We've got the millennials who don't want to own cars in the first place and they want to have those options. So being walkable, being able to have choices, to use a shared ride bike, to take transit, take a bus, to have all those options, it's a key part of the development. And, and in Salt Lake, you, you briefly mentioned sidewalks, but uh, how has uh, improving the pedestrian environment been part of building out your transit system? I, I mean, in my view, it actually starts with the pedestrian environment because if we have walkable neighborhoods and walkable communities and we have those nodes uh, where the commercial services and people want to go, uh, it makes it easier for people to get out of their vehicles, it makes it people to gain access to services, and it creates the kind of environment that people want in a city. And I mentioned the Sugar House streetcar line for us. That area was not only sort of auto-centric, uh, but it was very uncomfortable to get around on foot. Today, it is as lively as our downtown, which has become incredibly vibrant in the last three to five years. Um, so it makes a huge difference in both where people want to be. It makes a huge difference in the sort of quality of the experience that people, people seek, and it, uh, it's, it's what we want in cities. So, I mean, I view the pedestrian environment as where we, sh we really should be starting from, and then we build on that with all of the other modes, because if we create the right pedestrian environment and have the other supporting transit number one there, but having the other supporting modes, then, uh, then our communities are going to be the healthy places people want to be. Yeah. Washington was named the most walkable city in the U.S., and any time you're on a list like that, it's good and bad because, one, you have to live up to it and you want to make sure that people are safe as they're walking around the city. Um, from an international perspective, as we're going after that market, it's not just about the international market, but from an economic perspective, they stay longer, they spend more. They're not complaining about rates of hotels, so we go after that market for obvious economic reasons. Uh, the domestic market, harder to get them to walk. Um, I was just left a city, I um, guess I shouldn't name it, but Dallas. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, just going from, I, I mentioned to some folks that I was with, oh, it's just five blocks down the street, and they wanted to hop in their car. And, you know, in Washington, the mentality, you know, why would I drive five blocks? So it's harder for us to get the domestic community uh, accustomed to bike share and walking around. And then, of course, the local community to accept and embrace those, those changes, which are extremely important. Okay. A uh, couple hands over here. And, and then we'll come back over here. Okay. Hi. Uh, my name's Aisha. Um, I'm from California. So I'm wondering... Uh, where I'm from in Ventura County is just north of Los Angeles, and Los Angeles, thanks to Measure R, taxing itself just a little bit, has been expanding its rail and BRT networks. However, 
My county, although we're very pro slow growth and all of that, containing sprawl, uh, however, we don't have any real dedicated funds for transit, despite that we're part of NACTO for some reason. So I'm curious, even though we're on board with the design standards and what have you, uh, nobody wants to touch our county, and I'm not sure exactly what does that mean? How can we foster more of um, a partnership or coordination? Do we need a national infrastructure bank? I don't know what it'll take to help this cross-county network um, actualize, especially when we don't really know what high-speed rail, how long, as you said, it'll actually come. Um, so we don't necessarily have those dollars to leverage. So what do you do? Because that's only part of the picture. So um, okay. how do you get that cross-county um, uh, synergy? Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Big, big question may require Thanks, offline uh, conversation. <laughs> Go ahead, Michael. Or yeah, well, we don't typically opine on individual cities' <laughs> projects. The, the key there is, and, and the mayor can speak eloquently about it, you, you have to have everyone there telling the message. It has to be the business community. It has to be the citizens and it has to be government working together toward that common goal. We've seen a, a true renaissance in, in the greater LA basin, a tremendous amount of investment in, in looking at it in a holistic way. And the MTA there is, is not just transit, but they're the roads, they're the bridges, they look at it in a more holistic way and that's been a very good thing. And we've seen it you know, down the coast towards San Diego and, and moving up, up the coast as well. And there's good service you know, all the way up Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo and those other areas in some ways, but it continued to improve. And what we're seeing is more and more communities are, are investing in their cities and doing that local option and passing local transit taxes. And you saw the mayor talk about what they've done in Salt Lake City. There were 15 local transit tax elections last year, 11 of those passed a 70% passage rate. The previous year, an election year, presidential year, there were 49 of 62 local transit tax initiatives that passed a 79% passage rate. So it, what it comes down to, and I think as the mayor has, has shown us in Salt Lake and we've seen other communities, is that when you show a definitive project, here is what we are going to build, here is when we are going to build it, we will finish on this date, and here's the people you can hold accountable, then you'll see that voters support those initiatives. And that's why we have some challenges, as, as we talk about on the federal level, it's harder to hold the federal level accountable, and so it's, it's a bigger leap, and that's why local initiatives tend to move more quickly than, than it does on the federal level at times. Um, there's, okay, we'll take this question and then over here. Okay. Hi, I'm Henry. I'm from the National Association of Railroad Passengers. And I was just wondering if you saw a difference in the economic impact of rail-based transit versus um, road-based transit such as BRT. Thank you. Well, it's, it's really about the environment you build in. BRT can have a very similar impact to rail, uh, but it's about the infrastructure you put in with it. If you're just putting up colorful signs, that may not do it. Um, if you saw you saw the pictures we had of talking about what we've got on in Utah or in Cleveland or other cities have major, major investment. We've got a big one going on in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan right now, first one state of Michigan, where you have that built environment. You've got level platforms. You've got shelters that embrace the community uh, locally and, and reflects that. Um, where you see that build out and where you see uh, oftentimes a, a portion of the track of the roadway that is dedicated uh, right away, then you'll see communities that will build around it, and you can see a very similar economic impact. All that we do in Washington is, is this, uh, as we look at the drive-in market, um, a large part of it, um, it, it ties into Amtrak's accessibility from Boston to Washington, D.C., and other points as well. So as you look at our marketing efforts um, and short-term opportunities to bring people, because most visitors now, or most of us, we decide where we're going three months out versus a year um, which is how it was done about 20 years ago. So there's a greater opportunity for us to get some short-term visitation from, um, from New York. So a lot of what we do, as a matter of fact, we're going to Australia in a couple weeks with New York City, and we're going with New York and Philadelphia because the only nonstop flights are um, from uh, Australia to the East Coast are into New York. So a lar large part of what we're doing, and we're seeing larger numbers of Australians coming to Washington. Eventually, we'd like to get a nonstop flight, but what we're doing with those other cities, for obvious reasons, is going over to Sydney and to other and, and to New Zealand and promoting the package with Amtrak for obvious reasons. And Amtrak will be there with us. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, here. 
I'm Mark Funkhauser. I'm the publisher for Governing. I just wanted to make a comment. Um, you know, Mayor Becker mentioned that they used to have a wonderful streetcar system in the 50s until Roger Rabbit took it away. And uh, uh, Mr. Ferguson mentioned that there's no train going west out of, uh, out of D.C. I'm a big train rider. My wife won't fly, so I spend a lot of time on Amtrak. I want to point out that in both of those instances, uh, that subway system or that, that streetcar system was built by private companies. Those were private streetcar systems virtually everywhere. Uh, and Amtrak is a recent creation that took over private, privately built rail lines that ran all over the United States. So there is a way to simply go back to where we were before and get a great deal more uh, investment from the private sector. Uh, we just have to think, I think, creatively, and I'd, I'd welcome your thoughts about that, but it's, you know, I think it's important to remember that what we have now is a recent aberration you know, from the 50s or the 70s. Before that, we had privately built transit systems, including you know, Penn Station in, in, uh, in New York, was built by the Penn Central Railroad. Mm -hmm. It wasn't built by the government. Okay. Unfortunately, the Penn Central is gone now. Yeah. yeah. Well. And, uh, and many of those uh, electric railways were part of the uh, power company. That's why they're called the traction companies. And uh, as their business models changed, as uh, more options became available, uh, the, eventually in, in the late 50s, early 60s, and then led to the, what became the Urban Mass Transit Act of 64, uh, because those systems were being abandoned, because they simply weren't viable anymore, and they couldn't, sus couldn't sustain those economically. Uh, they turned them over to the cities and said, we need your help. It's important for the city to have good transportation, but we couldn't afford to do it under their business model. And um, we, can, we can teach a history class on that, but probably not in this session today. Yeah. Indeed. All right. Go ahead. Hello. Art, Art Gazzetti with APTA. Uh, my question would be for Elliot. <clears throat> and Elliot, in your remarks, you mentioned that, uh, uh, you know, uh, was it 12, 12 million tourists, uh, 18? 18. 18 million uh, tourists a year in Washington. And that was, uh, uh, you want the people, but the cars, uh, the, the system is such that, you know, you're already full. Um, uh, you're, the association you're representing, the U.S. Travel Association, I'm going to ask you to go back 10 years. Uh, was is the attitudes changed uh, compared to 10 years ago? Was 10 years ago uh, uh, maybe more saying uh, uh, yes, we want people and cars, and now it's more saying uh, well, you know that's not working anymore. We want the people, but not the cars. I'm just asking how it's evolved over, say, the last 10 years or so. Right, right. Um, I, I think you know, and I'm representing Destination DC and of course US Travel, um, but I think it really varies from city to city. In a city like Washington DC, 10 years ago. You know, the reality is if you drive a car in Washington, it's fine. But, you know, I, don't write me letters about how much it costs to park the car or, or all the other things that I get. So I, I think that, the re, you know, the balance for me is to educate. Uh, and it's like going to New York. Who, who drives a car to New York City and you pay $80 a day for parking, sometimes more than the hotel room? So I think there are certain realities of going to, in going to urban environments and taking a vehicle that is probably not the best thing to do. Uh, Twelve years ago, I lived in Atlanta. I would have a different attitude about driving into a city like Atlanta uh, because it's different in terms of being able to get around from from city to from area to area. But in Washington D.C. and we all live here, we know that um, it's it's you don't need a car. And at the end of the day, that's the message: is you do not need a, a car to get around the, the the city. And that's why it's well because of public transportation and, and the growth of public. And that's the point of this: the the whole infrastructure, the growth of infrastructure, makes it easier to get from point A to point B, and now it's growing to other areas, and that's why it's great that we'll go out to Dallas, because the experience suggests getting off a plane, coming into the city, and going to other parts, including other cities, without actually taking a, a vehicle, which we, so if there's anyone here from America, uh, AAA or anyone, anything like that, I love cars, but, <laughs> but uh, so that's not the message, but, the, but clearly there are certain um, inherent responsibilities and, and that are associated with bringing a car to the city. And then the reality is when you bring it and you park it, you're not going to drive it anymore anyway. So it's like, you know, so it, it just makes sense to, to rely on public transportation. It's a good question. You can zip car if you need to. Or a zip car, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And all sorts of options like that are coming up now. Um, any other questions or comments? Okay, up here.
Uh, yes, hello, Curtis Tate of McClatchy Newspapers. Uh, great uh, presentation today. Um, I read not too long ago that uh, that there was a, uh, a a proposal for a BRT project in Nashville, and that the uh, the state legislature effectively. Um, made it impossible for that project to go forward. What sort of concern is there about, um, you know, places that, are, you know, lawmakers that might want to make a political statement at the expense of, of transit projects? Well, to clarify, the legislation that was passed in Tennessee uh, just asked that the project come back to the legislature, and the, the issue there had to do with taking a dedicated lane just for transit or not. And, and I think, as, as the mayor pointed out early, the, it's always the first project that's the hardest, and, and rarely does the manager that starts the first project is he there for the ribbon cutting, unless they're in the audience. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's, it's an initial start. I, I've run that corridor with the CVB people, and you've got a beautiful new uh, uh, convention center downtown. It's really changing the, the, how people move about in, in Nashville. And uh, I think you're going to see those, uh, those travel demands change. But there is a real need for that. It's a very good project overall, and it, they're just going to change some of the, the scope and how they work with it going forward, but I think that overall what you're seeing is you've got to get past that first one, and once you build the first one, then it continues to grow, and certainly Salt Lake is an outstanding example of, of that. Uh, I wanted to ask a question with regard to ridership, because um, I know that overall, uh, certainly in terms of talking to art, you know, in, in terms of looking at what's happened when new transit lines have gone in and that they very quickly have been meeting projections. And Mayor uh, Becker talked uh, about that a little bit in terms of when you first opened. Could you talk a little bit more in terms of, of the kinds of ridership and the expansion then that you are hoping for? So when the... Um uh, we don't have enough information yet, I don't think, to be able to talk about our streetcar line because it just opened last December and mm -hmm. there's some unique uh, conditions there that I think will take some time before we know what real ridership is like. But for all of our other lines, our commuter rail lines and our light rail lines, the ridership has exceeded projections, sometimes doubling projections immediately. Wow. Um, and I think it, what it does tell me um, is uh, going into a pre-rail um, experience uh, is the belief was that people in the West wouldn't get out of their cars. Uh, but the key is to be able to give people a decent option uh, that's different than a car. And as soon as that happened, uh, we saw people change. Um, and today, I think our challenge is to keep up with what the demand is for more more transit. In our case, because our rail backbone is now well established, it is much more about fleshing out the system with other modes. Um, and I think there's a demand there, and if we can get our help, as was talked about before, sometimes at all levels of government don't look at things the way we do locally, I've noticed. And uh, so in our case, we actually need help from our state to be able to give us the authority to raise our transit revenues. And um, back to a point made earlier, from my vantage point in our city, uh, whether uh, the funding or the opportunities come from a, a public or a private source is immaterial. It's whatever source will allow us to make the improvements that help our community. And uh, I think we're in an era where um, the expectation is that if we have a well-run transit system, which we certainly do um, in Utah, uh, that we're going to have a much more efficient system using the infrastructure that's built in de developing the system. I know when we started the streetcar, we looked very carefully at having Salt Lake City administer the system and doubling up on administrative costs um, and trying to provide things like maintenance facilities and all those kinds of things were just beyond the pale for startup costs for us. So for us, it just made all the sense in the world to stick with an existing good operator. But it may be different in other places, and we're certainly open to looking at whatever will work. And I just have to say, Dallas, talked about largest light rail system in the country currently, and they're soon being connected to the DFW airport. So they're mm -hmm. seeing that investment there as well. And just to, to put a wrap on that, we saw last year the highest ridership in public transit since 1956, when Eisenhower was president. It was uh, 10.7 billion trips on public transportation. So certainly there are people are riding it and, and using it all across the nation. So to follow up on that, 
in terms of thinking about all of the economic development uh, benefits that that you talk about in terms of the report and that Mayor Becker talked about in terms of Salt Lake and what we're seeing here in DC, then are are you seeing a lot of pent up demand across the country in terms of local governments saying we need to do more or what's what's kind of happening there? I think the biggest shift we're seeing is it's a holistic view. It used to be we'd look at there's our streets here, there's our development here, there's transit over there, and we looked at them as in siloed entities. And what we're seeing now is this much more holistic view that it's about our community working well, it's about our transportation network working well, it's about the productivity, the energy efficiency of our communities, and if those all work together seamlessly, we can have a much stronger community and it's more economically viable and more globally competitive. And as you look at, think about what your city looked like 10 years ago, and, and oftentimes there's a very domestic looking network of businesses in your community, and you look there now and they're very, very international. And as Elliot talked about, not just bringing tourists in, but bringing businesses into your community, they have an expectation of being able to get their employees there safe, reliable, dependable. And if they're able to do that, it brings their economic cost of doing business down. That makes your city better to, a better option. Great. Um, and I was just curious, Mayor Becker, in terms of thinking about your whole role as uh, in leadership role with regard to the National League of Cities. Like, do you anticipate, in terms of your other um, uh, colleagues, other mayors, that that this is an area that they are really looking for additional expansion and, and additional help. Yeah, I can tell you our experience through the National League of Cities and the surveys we do for all the communities, there are over 17,000 cities in the United States, so we can get a pretty good cross-section when we survey and find out what's important to them. And when we, transportation is a key and a key to success and dwindling traditional sources of revenue like gas tax revenues make it very difficult. Um, but but the, the paradigm has shifted, I think, across the country. And it's happening not just in the denser urban areas. It's happening throughout our urban areas, which represent 80% of our population, that people want choices. They want to be able to be able to get around in different ways, whether it's the millennials, where it's just natural for them to think in those terms, or whether it's those of us who have been around for a long time. Uh, we're looking for ways to get around that fit our needs, and we want to have the options, whether that's getting around on a bike, where it's a nice short-term commute, whether it's connecting a bike to transit, where we can uh, easily kind of get around and not have to worry about driving, um, or whether it's having uh, zip cars or, you know, look at what's happening now with cabs. I mean, with Lyft and Uber and all these other uh, options that are coming up, those options are what people want, and it's where I think we're, we're looking to see both continuing, hopefully, federal funding, but a shift in the funding that reflects what people are looking for today. And that's a challenge, because it's folks who are older that are making the decisions, usually, and uh, you add that to the political dynamic that we have today, and it's hard to make those changes. But uh, my sense uh, from a community level is that we know what folks want. We need help in realigning and restructuring some of the revenues we get and the sources of revenues so that we can be successful for our communities. Great. Well, and I th think that it's so important as the whole discussion debate over policy and the transportation bill goes forward here in terms of thinking about how um, valuable it is to really look at what is happening in these communities across the country, the benefits, the multiple kinds of benefits that are being seen, and what what everybody's constituents are seeing and how they are accessing transit and how that needs to fit into then the national policy purview. So um, if there are any last questions or comments, Otherwise, I want to thank our wonderful panel very, very much. And this is really, really helpful discussion. And thank you very, very much.